All right. Now, I think we're uh, ready to go with today's webinar. Um, hello, my name is Camilla, uh, Camilla Klebner. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oldenburg in Germany. My own research is at the intersections of economic geography, innovation studies, and transition studies. I Myself, I'm employed in a project called RENIA, uh, RENIA uh, Regional Energy Transitions, where we have looked at six German regions in terms of wind energy. It's my great honor to host this uh, new series of the, the, the first session of the new series of the CREST seminars. CREST has been previously hosted uh, and is still being organized by Will Eaton and Lauren Norris, uh, and I'm now coming in and also doing my bit of chairing, I guess. Uh, Quest has been about bringing together um, researchers from a range of career stages to showcase their work. Um, today's session is on the theme of municipal action uh, for sustainability. Um, before we begin, um, I would just like to say a few words uh, about our great host, the RSA. Uh, the Regional Studies Association is a global and interdisciplinary uh, network for urban and regional research development and policy. The RSA does support its members um, with the latest research, funding schemes, networking and publishing opportunities, and of course, spaces to grow research and our careers. Um, as a part of this kind of ongoing global crisis, the RSA board has put in place different kinds of initiatives to support its members uh, and the wider community. Examples include the professional development webinar, which I myself, for example, have chaired just at the beginning of this uh, month, it has been on the subject of imposter syndrome. You can find the video uh, of this in the RSA members launch online. Uh, or another example might be the Thingio webinar series, a very lively webinar series, uh, which is being run by the Global Network on Financial Geography. Um, you can also find the dates and the respective subjects uh, in the section online on the RSA website. Um, there's also a new RSA app uh, called the RSA Hub. Uh, this helps you to organize your own attendance at uh, different RSA events throughout the year. Before we start with the talks, there's just a few bits of general info I want to give to you, uh, just to make you aware. This session today is being uh, recorded uh, and will also be made available to members on the RSA website in the RSA launch. If you have any questions, and of course we encourage you to have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen so we can administer them quite easily. Um, and if you like to tweet about these kinds of events, just as I like to do, uh, then please don't forget to use the hashtag RSA webinar when you tweet about it. So um, as I mentioned, today's session is on the subject of municipal action for sustainability transitions. And we have two speakers today. Uh, the first one is Professor Andrew Cambus from the University of Glasgow. Uh, and the second speaker will be Dr. Catherine Sugar from the US University of Edinburgh. And we're very pleased to have both of you here. Um, so we turn to our first speaker, Andrew. Um, Andrew, you self-described as, as an academic and political activist. Uh, you trained initially as an economic geographer, but currently you're a professor of political economy at the University of Glasgow and also the editor-in-chief of the journal Urban Studies. Your current research focuses upon the role of economic democracy and pub public participation in creating more equitable and sustainable forms of development outside of ac academia, you have been writing and advocating for democratic forms of public ownerships, uh, ownership for almost three decades. And I don't want to take away from your talk, so um, I, I shall hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Camilla, and thanks for inviting me here today. I'll just share my uh, PowerPoint screen to start off with. Okay, is that is that oh, oh, is that there for everybody? Yeah. Good. Um, so today's talk is uh, based on ongoing research I'm doing, uh, funded by the European Research Council, and I'll also bring in some, some material from a, a parallel project that's been funded by the EU on uh, municipal energy transition uh, that I've spoken to the RSA about uh, before, actually, back in the summer. Um, so the, the, the main basis of the talk really is this amazing trend of remunicipalization uh, that's going on, or local local level deprivatization of public services assets and infrastructures that's going on around the world. 
it's a global trend evident since 2000. Um, it's a significant moment, um, myself and my team argue, in the mutation of, a, of wider processes of neoliberal governance with all their contradictions and failings. Now, my take home point today, in case I do run out of time, is that remunicipalization uh, reflects a wider crisis of political and economic governance, particularly at the local and the regional scales. These are the scales, of course, of everyday life where basic social reproduction needs are met. And in particular, we're seeing the limits of a marketized and privatized discourse, uh, the centerpiece effectively of neoliberal hegemony to deliver essential public services. This has become evident initially in the water, energy and transport sectors and in the context of climate change. But it's also been brought home uh, more tragically and tangibly by the COVID pandemic in the, in, in the public health and care sectors, where particularly in the UK, but elsewhere, um, a reliance on privatised and market solutions has often had quite, quite fatal and tragic consequences. So, so we see in a very tragic way, perhaps, in a very tangible way at the moment, the contradictions between profit and attempts to financialize, increasing attempts to financialize even public services and assets, uh, exchange value in, in Marxist terms, and the increasingly urgent social and ecological imperatives to deal with critical, the critical public policy issues of our time. In short, we have a clash of values, which is bringing in its, in its turn, a new set of policies and discourses around the return of the state um, at all geographical scales. But alongside that, there's a stubborn commitment amongst many global elites to sort of profit and market imperatives. And these remain dominant at global and national elite levels. So in the brief time I have available today, I want to sketch out in broad terms, some key aspects of this remunicipalization trend. I want to then place it in a broader governance context of faltering and crisis prone neoliberalism and the return of the state before drawing on some specific energy related cases of remunicipalization, uh, which I think feed into the kind of broader sort of seminar series that we're part of um, and, and how those are playing out. And then I want to follow up with a, with a brief and short conclusion. So remunicipalization, what is it? As I say here in the slide, it's a, it's a global but spatially uneven process. It's a trend that's been apparent probably since 2000 for cities, towns, and subnational territories around the world to take formerly privatized services assets back into public ownership. Now, in our definition, we also include um, newly created public entities. Um, and there's been quite an interesting plethora of, of new public services being created around the world too, uh, in some diverse places. So there's everything from the Hamburg Energy Company, which I'm gonna mention later on, which was, 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 was set up by the local state uh, to, 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 to sort of more rapidly um, transition away from fossil fuels. And you also have examples from the global south, such as in the Re Recoleta district um, of Santiago in Chile, where there's been a whole series of initiatives, particularly around public health, um, to, to make up for a lack of public provision um, in, in, that, in that city. Um, so as you'll see from the graph, uh, there's been quite a, a dramatic uh, trend of increase from 2000 up until about the mid 2010s, a peak in, in uh, around about 2016 and 17. And the material and the data that, that, that I'm talking about here today is part of a, a very interesting and collaborative process with our partners, our NGO partners, the Transnational Institute, where we've been cataloging and mapping cases of remunicipalization around the world um, in, um, um, and we've now set up a, a public futures database, which is a, an online uh, tool that's, that's publicly available for people to um, look at this trend um, and, uh, and, and study it um, if, they, if they wish to. As you can see, uh, it, it is a global trend. Um, if you look at the, the, the lower map on the slide, um, remunicipalization, deprivatization is happening everywhere around, around the world. Uh, but it's got particular epicenters and, and a particular concentration in, in, Europe, in Europe in particular, but also interestingly in North America, in, in the U USA, there's been a lot of deprivatization going on as well. Uh, we can perhaps touch upon that more in the discussions. But Europe is the dominant continent as you, of deprivatization, as you'll see from the map. And that's um, largely because it was perhaps the, 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 the real center, the heartland of privatization in the first place in the 1990s. And we see within Europe also particular country epicenters, um, Germany in the energy sector, as I'll come on to, and France in the water sector have been, have been dominant uh, centers of remunicipalization. But we are seeing um, new epicenters emerging, um, particularly uh, uh, Spain and the UK in recent years, 
um, uh, which is which is again quite quite interesting, and and we're just at the start really of researching what's happening in those in those places. As you can see from the global map, it's less prevalent in the global south, and a lot of the remunicipalization that's going on there is often uh, a reaction against Washington Bank, uh, Washington Consensus, sorry, um, IMF, World Bank imposed privatizations in the 1990s, particularly in Latin America, uh, where there are, there are some celebrated examples in places like uh, Bolivia. Why is it happening? Um, I think at a very basic level, we can talk about the failings of privatization to deliver its promised uh, efficiency gains, um, its, it, its uh, the promised investment and re reduction in costs that, 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 were, that were held out as reasons for moving things out of the public sector in the first place are just not being delivered. Um, so th there's a common trend when you, when, you, when you dig into the data and you look at the cases around the world, you know, wh whichever continent, whichever country you're talking about, there is a common set of, of, of failings of privatization that are evident. And you'll see this from the, the pie chart on, on the graph, where the, uh, the two biggest reasons that, that people give um, when, they, when they give reasons for uh, remunicipalization are the poor, poor quality of services of privatized utilities and um, growing costs alongside um, deteriorating quality of services. Those are the, those are the key things. There are other interesting, uh, I, I think, motivations, uh, particularly critical public policy objectives like dealing with climate change are often are often to the fore as well. Now, I think what's interesting about the trend is it, it, there's a diverse uh, politics to it across the political spectrum. It's not just a, a sort of left wing or left of center policy, but we see um, all kinds of uh, political administrations from, from left to right engaging in, in deprivatization processes. And again, we can perhaps come back to that um, a, a bit more um, in the discussion later. Uh, there is a bit of a debate in academic circles about whether it's a pragmatic trend um, of, of, of local, local civil servants just, just doing things that, that are value for money or whether there's more ideological uh, and political concerns behind it. And, and again, I, I can't speak too much to that today. But I think what I, what I would emphasize here, if we, if we dig deeper beneath the surface of, uh, of, of privatization's failures, we, we can identify two things. First, in the increasing tensions and contradictions of neoliberal governance logics, um, the way that privatization and marketization, financialization are coming up against critical public policy challenges like climate change or, or tackling public health crises. And then, and then if we want to go to a deeper structural level again, I think, I think I would say it's about the contradictions and growing public policy failures relating to the need to provide basic social reproduction um, needs for populations and the logic of exchange value and, uh, and profit maximization. Now, these kind of contradictions are very evident in these two, in these two graphs that I, that I put up here on the, uh, on, on, the, on the screen. On the left-hand side, you can see um, new pressures on governments around the world continuing into the 2000s and right to the present day, continuing pressures to privatize public assets that come from uh, bodies like the European Commission, the IMF and the OECD. Um, particularly linked to the, the fallout from the financial crisis, uh, the Eurozone crisis and, and austerity measures. We've seen continuing pressures by a global elite or uh, lo local and national politicians to privatize assets. But on the at the same time, on the right-hand side of the graph, you'll see there is the ongoing reality, uh, this is what's happening on the ground in a way, of, of, of a growing government debt um, trend. And, and this figure is the, the OECD average to deal with accumulating crises. And I would expect this figure uh, these figures and these trends to increase again if we would if we, we would have update uh, data that uh, deals with the, uh, um, the, the the pandemic. Now, at the same time, I think um, in almost every significant area of public policy, there is a sort of faltering and stubborn adherence to a flawed marketization discourse by political and governing elites which is increasingly out of step, first of all, with what is needed to tackle humanity and the planet's common shared problems. And secondly, with what's actually happening on the ground. There's a bit of a disjunct disjuncture in, in many ways between elite discourses and, and kind of local and regional daily realities of people's localized lives. And these, con these contrasting quotes, which I've taken from um, EU, EU policy documents to deal with the energy transition, in, in some ways, I, th I think they, they bring home this, 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 this rupture, if you like. The first quote, um, which comes from the, Europe, the EU Committee of the Regions, 
um, emphasizes the, the importance really of trying to put energy transition in the hands of citizens, to have a decentralized and democratized uh, process of energy transition, and to really tackle key goals like fighting energy po poverty. Whereas the second quote um, represents the European Commission's kind of unwieldy attempt to somehow talk about community and energy, but, but still in a very consumerist and marketized discourse when it talks about, if you like, um, defining energy communities as providing opportunities for consumers to participate in markets. And I think the, these kind of contradictions go to the heart of some of the questions that we're, we're perhaps interested in here today. So in the remaining time I have available, I want to just focus upon um, what's happening in, in one key epicenter of remunicipalization, and, that, and that's Germany, where we've, see, we've seen um, the, the, the largest number of remunicipalizations happening around the, around the world, particularly in the energy sector. At one level, we can point to common global experiences of poor performance under privatization. But at the same time, I think there are particular spatially inflected geographical pathways and trajectories that are evident. And in Germany, um, one of the interesting things and one of the reasons we've had so many remunicipalizations is that German, re German remunicipalization and neoliberalism itself um, was in fact a much more, much more partial affair than it perhaps in the, somewhere like the UK. So what happened with privatization in the 1990s is that um, Germans, Germany's local authorities, they, they didn't sort of sell off um, their, their, their energy assets completely to the private sector, but they set up a series of franchises over, over a certain time period, 15 or 20 years. And what we see in Germany is when these, when these uh, privatized uh, franchises have come up for renewal, because of, largely because of poor performance, many local authorities are just choosing to take them back into public ownership and control. In Germany, there's also, of course, the energy vendor politics, which is driving both grassroots mobilization and resistance against privatization, largely because the private energy utilities are not transitioning fast enough because they tend to be um, still wedded to uh, old carbon based forms of, of energy. But we also see local actors too um, intervening to, uh, to take back uh, public control of energy where, where it's possible. Um, there's also an interesting conflict in Germany between a continuing uh, constitutional commitment um, to, uh, to, to have social provision for citizens and the kind of marketization of imperatives um, at, at EU level and national level that are apparent elsewhere. Uh, and another interesting thing about Germany, again, is, is perhaps a continuing commitment at a, at a local and regional level to, um, to, to kind of lo local autonomously driven economic development over a kind of more globalized neoliberal view of the world. Um, so I'm just going to touch upon sort of two, two examples that, that bear out um, how, how the remunicipalization process is pl playing out slightly different in Germany. And I, I would say here that actually even within Germany, you see, you see sort of diverse experiences of remunicipalization and different kind of determinations, as Althusser would say, at the heart of, uh, of the broader trend. So Hamburg, for example, is one of the celebrated cases of remunicipalization. There was a, a mass mobilization and a citizen's kind of initiative to take back control of the electricity grid, very much against uh, elite, uh, elite interests. Um, there was a very strong coal and nuclear lobby in, in Hamburg, trade unions and a, and a very strongly rooted um, private utility. Actually, the, the Swedish state-owned company Vattenfall dominated the energy sector and, and was awarded the franchises after privatization. Um, but increasingly, there was a kind of grassroots mobilization and also um, some green politicians began to argue for, uh, for um, having a a publicly controlled energy system as uh, Vattenfall uh, dragged its feet on, on a carbon transition, largely because uh, Hamburg was, was dominated by sort of coal, coal interests in particular. Uh, and we've seen a, a series of very successful initiatives to take back control of the energy system. There was a citizens referendum in 2014 um, because the Social Democrats who were in government there were, were opposed to uh, remunicipalization. They, they did drag their feet um, even after a successful referendum. But now there is a strong commitment um, to, uh, to establish uh, a, a much more, uh, a much faster um, energy transition uh, process. And, and that includes a very interesting policy to try to switch um, 600,000 homes in uh, Hamburg away from uh, gas powered heating to district, district heating and, um, and renewables by 2030. The other, very quickly, because I know I'm probably running out of time, the other interesting example that we've come up on our, in our research of energy remunicipalization, where you see slightly different factors and processes at work, is in the state of Turingham, where TEAG, um, which is basically the, uh, the Turingham Public Energy Company, 
um, that, that, that company was owned by E.ON, um, one, of the, one of the big utility privatized companies, again, very slow in moving towards uh, tackling climate change. But if you look at what was really driving the remunicipalization there, it was really local, a kind of local community wealth building pr project. Um, TAG was the biggest employer in the state of Turingen in the former East Germany. Um, there was a real move, if you like, to regain local control of the economy after, after uh, privatization and, and uh, the sort of transition to democracy in the, in the 1990s. Um, and although, the, although TAG, the, the public company, has now embarked upon more and more ambitious uh, renewable energy schemes, I, I think it's fair to say that there is really local economic development and benefits that, uh, that, were, that were key there. I will wrap up very, very quickly. Um, and all, all I would say very broadly is that actually what, what we see from the kind of remunicipalization trend is, is we see at one level kind of these sort of systemic failures of neoliberalism um, and uh, at the same time a sort of contradictory continuing elite pushing of marketization and privatization processes but growing contradictions of that and therefore the return of the state at local levels we've seen here but also um, at other levels in, in the in the economy uh, but I think remunicipalization, um, we'll have to find another term for this that isn't so tongue twisting at some point. What it also suggests is, is perhaps there are other econo economic, social, ecological values um, um, that, come, that come out in some of, these, some of these campaigns. And there's a real possibility, perhaps, for a very different way of doing a democratic way of doing a, a local, local politics that engages citizens more. I think there's also dangers of a, a drift to the, the right and a more populist form of of state if, if the kind of mainstream elites, the global elites that are still driving privatization discourses don't kind of come to terms with the contradictions of neoliberalism more broadly. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Um, I think we will give ourselves a couple of minutes because we have an immediate question. And I think I will also Add on to that. So Lou Miller here asked, to what extent do remunicipalization uh, motives differ across different countries and regions? You alluded a little bit to the spatial distribution, and I would also be quite curious, beyond Germany, what other centers kind of would you say of, of this other uh, of this kind of activity? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, we, I mean, we I, I did reference some of my papers as I was going along, and, and if you're interested in that question, I guess there's a paper in the journal Antipode that deals with that. Um, I, I think we, we talk about a kind of, um, we're at a critical c conjuncture in terms of broader global patterns of economic governance. So I, I think we can talk about a common pushback against privatization and its effects, because you know wherever you are, whether you're in South America, um, whether you're in Europe or even in, in, uh, in North America, in the US, you know, one of the things people have found without outsourcing to private contractors is, is poor performance and actually the way that the way that profits profit does you know marketization and, and profit does mean that that there, that there is there's a common common experience of of not getting what was promised in terms of investment and modernization of facilities facilities and infrastructures <laughs> whether that's whether that's the water sector whether that's the energy sector or even transport or or, or whatever um, so that's a commonly shared um, experience and I think that comes out that if you go to the public features database you can see that comes out wherever you, wherever you are. But of course, I think there are particular um, spatial variations and trajectories at work here. This is why Germany is very interesting if you compare it with the UK, where the whole process of privatization was very different, very partial. Um, and that reflects very, I, I would argue, very different varieties of capitalism, for, for want of a better word, and, and, and different social forces at the heart of capitalism in different countries and even in different places. Um, if you look at Germany, as I said, as I've just hinted at briefly, What's driving remunicipalization in Hamburg is very different to what's driving it in uh, in, in, in Turingen. So it, it, it is it is a very spatially diverse process, but there are nevertheless these common trends, which I think point to point to broader failings in neoliberal governance. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy, um, for this answer to, to this initial question. I can see that there are plenty of more questions already flowing in now, but I think we'll uh, put them to after uh, both your talks. And I shall now take a moment to introduce Dr. Catherine Sugar from the University of Edinburgh to you. Catherine is an early career researcher and has recently completed a PhD at the University of Glasgow. Uh, you investigated urban, urban governance for low carbon and inclusive transitions. Uh, you have a background in geography and ecological economics, and you're concerned with multi-level governance of low carbon and equitable 
transitions and have a particular interest in the different actors involved, the implementation of projects in practice, and the challenges encounters, encountered and overcome. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Camilla. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. So I hope everyone can see that okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Catherine Sugar, and I'm delighted to be speaking to you all today. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm a research fellow at the University of Edinburgh. And for today's uh, webinar, I would like to talk to you about my PhD research, which I recently completed at the University of Glasgow. As Camilla introduced, my PhD investigated sustainable urban governance, and I used the case study of Nottingham, which I'll speak about today, as I think it's a great example um, of a city taking municipal action for sustainability in practice. To give you some research context, we will all be well aware of the climate challenges that we face today and in the future. Particularly within recent years, there has been a spatial turn in transitions, which has led to an increased focus on the role of cities for implementing sustainable transitions, primarily because cities have high energy consumption, population growth and economic activity, and also they're at the municipal level, which is closest to many citizens. So my PhD investigated the governance of low carbon and equitable urban transitions in practice. Specifically, I investigated the key governing actors, so that includes the state and the non-state actors engaging with low carbon and just urban transitions, the main barriers and tensions that were encountered, the key factors that have helped in the implementation of transitions in practice, and the key policies on local, national and international levels, which are progressing or hindering transitions. To introduce my conceptual framing, my PhD was in geography, but for this research, I aim to take an interdisciplinary approach across geography, business and engineering to complement this complex topic. There have been a wide range of disciplines and perspectives studying sustainable transitions, which have produced multiple frameworks, for example, the multi-level perspective. Whilst they have, of course, progressed transitions thinking, I found that most established frameworks were limited from having either underdeveloped concepts or a complete omission of key aspects, which I think are crucial for sustainable transitions thinking. So I therefore created my own conceptual framework, as you can see on the slide on the right, um, which was a combination of key concepts and themes that I used to develop my own understanding of low carbon and just transitions at the local level across sectors such as energy, housing and transport. I identified four key overarching themes in the literature that positions my research, and this includes the multi-level governance, cities, justice in sustainable transitions and the approaches and pathways in sustainable transitions. I then drew out the key concepts within the literature that I felt needed more attention. And this included the notions of path dependency and lock-in, justice dimensions such as energy justice and transport justice and spatial elements such as austerity urbanism. But because of time constraints today, unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail about these theories and concepts. But I'd like to focus my findings by looking more closely at the concepts of political capacity, agency and local ownership. And argue that by re-embedding these concepts, we can develop a deeper understanding of urban governance processes and municipal action for sustainability. But before I delve into my findings, I'd like just to take a few minutes to introduce the Nottingham case study and my methodology. So for those of you who might not be familiar, Nottingham is a medium sized city located in the East Midlands of England, as shown on the map. Like many cities in the UK, it experiences environmental problems and persistent social inequality, ranking 11th most deprived local authority in England. It stood out to me as an interesting case study because it's a city with different low carbon initiatives across different sectors. And these schemes have a clear justice dimension as I'll discuss later. But notably in January, 2020, 
Nottingham City Council made headlines by setting a strong public commitment to become the UK's first carbon neutral city by 2028. And this makes the city distinctive from others and sets it apart in terms of its uh, climate goals. I used a qualitative research approach, which included 35 in-depth interviews with a wide range of stakeholders across sectors within and out with the city. I used secondary documentary analysis, which ranged from formal to informal sources. And I also supplemented this with observational research and site visits. So I'll now talk about my research findings. And as I already mentioned, I'll draw out the Nottingham, uh, Nottingham case study as a contemporary example to highlight how the municipality has taken an integrated approach across sectors to increase sustainability. So I'll do this by talking about the concepts of political capacity, agency and ownership to illustrate how these are useful for contributing to understanding on urban governance of low carbon and inclusive transitions. So first of all, from the Nottingham example, it is clear that the political capacity of the local authority is influenced by its structure and responsibilities. Briefly, the city of Nottingham is governed by two different local governments with different political administrations, Nottingham City Council and Nottinghamshire County Council. Nottingham City Council, the area in yellow on the map, is a unitary authority and has a compact administrative boundary concentrated around the city centre. In comparison, Nottinghamshire County Council, the area in green, is a two-tier authority, which is also divided into seven different districts. And this area includes the wealthier outskirts and suburbs. The structure of the local authority is significant for low carbon and equitable transitions because of the variations of responsibility. As shown in the table on the right, Unitary authorities like Nottingham City Council are responsible for providing all local services, such as environmental health, housing and planning. Two tier authorities like Nottinghamshire County Council, however, have their responsibilities divided between themselves and their districts. And you can see this in, by the green arrow in the different columns. Interviewees stated that implementing low carbon and equitable projects can be considered as more efficient and centralized processes for unitary authorities like Nottingham City Council, since decisions are made in-house within the council with potentially less disruption from fewer political actors. And this political capacity and responsibility is important from a justice perspective. Since unitary authorities like Nottingham City Council have all responsibilities in-house, they are arguably more engaged with issues of energy and affordable warmth and fuel poverty at the city level, since this is within their remit. In comparison, the county councils have this responsibility spread out amongst their districts and they therefore don't have the specific remits such as housing. And so they're less inclined to be engaged with energy issues at the household level. So the different responsibilities amongst local authorities, which is influenced by the structure, affects the political capacity of local actors, which is really significant for sustainable urban governance. Second, the concept of agency is important by providing political stability, will and leadership. In terms of collective agency, the wider administration in Nottingham City Council is the Labour Party, which is currently in power and has held power since 91. As a result, the Labour Party in Nottingham has wielded a strong degree of political power, which has meant that they can plan policy in the long term and continue environmental and just initiatives. And this political stability has allowed for decisions to be made which might be considered politically controversial. And Nottingham's Labour Party have strong and long-standing environmental priorities. And this is reflected in its past environmental schemes to its present day carbon neutral target. In terms of individual agency, we can see this in the case of Nottingham, particularly in council members and capable and skilled officers who have driven projects forward. These local government actors in Nottingham are considered to have made particularly bold and brave decisions. And as highlighted by one interviewee, on the face of it, 
the schemes are not an obvious vote winner, you've really got to be quite bold and ambitious to be prepared to do it. The city council had people in power who have been very progressive about what they want for their city and perhaps emboldened about the stable position they've got and perhaps being prepared to go that bit further. So such leadership and political will is imperative for driving environmental projects forward in difficult political climates. So this combination of political capacity, which I spoke about before, and the individual and collective agency has led to the creation of innovative, sustainable and inclusive projects which demonstrate urban municipal action in practice. And an example of this is Robin Hood Energy, which was the first municipally owned energy service company in the UK. So this was run by Nottingham City Council and was an unusual and risky project which required 20 million in capital funding. Nottingham City Council set this up in response to high levels of fuel poverty, and so the company had strong justice dimensions. It went against the status quo of traditional energy supply companies, which allowed it to promote energy justice principles from having transparency in its ownership and energy prices, operating on a not-for-profit basis, and thereby allowing cost benefits to be passed on to consumers. However, during my research, Robin Hood Energy got privatized in September 2020 and was bought over by Centrica, who own British Gas. Ultimately, due to the UK's energy market and the competitive factors at play, Robin Hood Energy was uncompetitive and not financially viable as a municipally owned energy company. Finally, Local government ownership is significant for low carbon and equitable transitions. Nottingham City Council is very unique in the UK by being one of few councils which retained ownership of its bus network and social housing stock, rather than pursue the, the policies of privatization during the 1980s, as Andy briefly mentioned. So the democratic control of housing, transport and energy supply company in Nottingham allows a more just transition through serving in the interests of the public and not a private profit-driven motive, which can exacerbate inequalities. This local ownership has been central to the implementation of low carbon and just schemes. And in fact, it's an approach being pursued by other UK cities within recent years, such as Greater Manchester. We can see the clear benefits local ownership has for Nottingham in terms of low carbon and just transitions. The bus network is owned by Nottingham City Council and managed by Nottingham City Transport, which acts on both a commercial and non-commercial basis. The City Council has invested approximately 15.1 million since 2012 in its bus network, which has allowed the city to establish one of the largest electric bus fleets in the UK and Europe. With regards to the commercial, commercial bus operation, the municipal stake is beneficial for the whole transport system as profits of approximately 2 million per annum can be reinvested into public transport services. Crucially, these profits go towards the non-commercial services, which are deemed socially necessary. For example, free services to support mass suburban areas, employment sites, and hospital sites, etc. And this is important for mobility justice by increasing accessibility for residents to maintain leisure, retail, and health services. Alongside this, the City Council set up the workplace parking levy in 2012, which today is the first of its kind in the UK and Europe. Now, it places a charge on employers who provide more than 11 parking spaces by implementing a levy per additional car parking space. And again, this was a very controversial scheme, particularly amongst the business community. The reasons behind this, uh, this initiative were part of a commitment to tackle congestion traffic, but it also resulted in a fall in carbon emissions. But perhaps most importantly, the funds from the levy, which on average are about 12 million per year over a 23 year lifetime, are ring fenced for sustainable travel. 
specifically to pay off the loan for the city's electric tram extension and any extra are used to support sustainable transport schemes, which is again good for mobility justice. So the argument I'd like to make here is that the municipal ownership of these two low carbon schemes allows the city to generate sustainable income, which is being reinvested and can be considered as a process of path creation. So to summarize, the Nottingham example has shown that first municipal action for sustainability can be dependent on the municipal capacity of local government, particularly the structure of the local authority and its responsibility. Secondly, sustainable municipal action is contingent on agency on both collective and individual levels and can be influenced by political stability, will and leadership. And finally, municipal action for sustainability can be encouraged through local government ownership of assets and not-for-profit business models, such as energy supply companies, housing and transport. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions, comments and, reflex and reflections and please also do feel free to get in touch via email. All right, thank you, Catherine. That was a fascinating insight from Nottingham. Um, whilst you have been talking and we've been listening, Andrew has been answering lots and lots of questions already in writing, uh, but worry not, I've got a few more up my sleeve uh, that I can, I think I can ask both of you quite well. Uh, and that's gonna lead us into a nice discussion. First of all, however, Catherine, I would like to just ask you just out of interest, why choose Nottingham? Why is Nottingham such an interesting case? And do you think are there other cases across the UK or even in Europe? Um, that uh, the case of Nottingham might provide some transferable lessons to you? Yeah, that's um, quite a, a good question I get to, I guess, to get kickstarted off with. Um, so Nottingham, to me, is a really interesting case study. Um, it's a city, I think, that's gone under the radar quite a lot. Um, and so I think from a research perspective, it was very interesting for someone to go out there and figure out what uh, Nottingham are doing on the ground, and why. Um, in terms of a sort of logistical um, consideration, it was easy from, from the university for me to travel down and, and to travel. Um, but I think most of all, it was really interesting because it's, it's tended to go against the grain um, in many of its ways, as I hope I've, I've provided a, an example of um, in the, the presentation. Um, and I really was interested in exploring that part. In terms of other cities, um, there are certainly lots of different examples um, within the UK, that is. And I was quite overwhelmed at the beginning, I think, of my PhD in trying to find out where's best to, to look at. Everyone seems to be looking at different parts of cities. Should I look at the energy sector? Should I just look at transport? But what I wanted to look at was this, this sort of integrated approach. So what cities were doing across sectors, so energy and transport and housing. And there are quite a few examples within the, the UK. And I think the closest example would be Bristol, um, which is another city um, located in the Southwest of England. Um, so that's another example that definitely took my focus, but I think as, um, as a comparative study, there was just so much going on in Nottingham that I wasn't able to, to look at both equally. Um, but Br Bristol is certainly another um, really great example of municipal action at the local level. Thank you, Catherine. We are now beginning to have some first questions. Um, there's a question uh, from Lexi Holmes about uh, different reasons or factors. And I think I'm going to pick up on that and kind of um, put it into a question, uh, I guess, to both of you. Um, when we did our own project, Medea, we found that there was a kind of tension between the local level and often the, the federal level, or actually the land level, um, where decision makers at the very forefront at the local level felt often exposed and it felt that they lacked support from the other levels. Is that something, a kind of pattern that you can see too? Um, and also how do they have the capacity to overcome this kind of situation? Uh, and what kinds of resources do, do they draw on uh, to do so? And I think in a way, Andrew, you can probably pick up on that too, um, but I would like to put this question immediately now at the moment to Catherine. 
Yes, so um, I guess your question's about where did local level feel supportive um, from, from uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess as part of my, uh, my PhD, I looked at policy and it certainly shows in policy that there is a lot of disjointed and disconnected things. Um, so at the national level, there are certain targets set out um, and certain commitments made, but the actual policy um, is not supportive of that. So um, local authority, well, Nottingham in this instance, frequently complained about the, the financial cap uh, capacities that they don't have and urban, uh, I mean, austerity is a massive problem um, in that. Um, so again, councils are being cut, um, yeah, their funds are getting cut left, right and centre. So they're having less political capacity to do things on the ground. And I don't think that's felt by Nottingham, that's felt by all local authorities in the UK and, and in wider Europe. So they certainly didn't feel supported in that aspect. In terms of the skills um, and resources that they have, again, um, the financial uh, components of that play a huge element, but I think also they don't have the resources in-house to do that. So a lot of the time they did try to connect with other like-minded actors in the private or the third sector. But again, I think everyone was feeling um, quite restricted in that regard. Um, so the, the short answer to that would be, I think, no, I don't think they did feel very supported them, you know, to be honest. And I think that they could definitely have, have asked for more, for more support from the national level. Thank you, Catherine. Andrew, um, I think I'll, I'll let you build on this and perhaps add on the kind of small add on question of whether councils and municipalities maybe sometimes actually indirectly profit of this kind of leadership void on other levels. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the spatial context is really critical, I think it's very, I mean, this kind of capacity of local actors is very uneven across across Europe. Uh, we, we've, we've, often, we've certainly found that in our municipal um, uh, energy uh, project with the, with the EU. But I think, I think, I mean, I think interesting about Nottingham is, as, as, I, as, I, as I understand the case, is, is in, in a way it's, a, it's, it's an exceptional case in the UK because the uh, local authority didn't privatise um, a lot of its public assets, uh, and actually it had, a, it had a district heating system, a bit like in Denmark, uh, which was set up back in the 70s. So it still had public capacity to do things. So although, as Catherine says, it's been very constrained, I mean, U UK energy policy has been, a, has been a disaster since about 2010, um, because it's, I mean, I mean, not necessarily because the politicians don't talk a good game, as Boris Johnson is doing at the moment, but because because the, the policy is not a stable one, it's been very changeable, you know, um, and I think you do see that in a little bit in, in other parts of Europe, but not quite as much as in the UK. So the UK, the UK's energy policy is climate change objectives have been a bit all over the place um, and, and the lack of a stability, I think, um, as well as austerity um, for local policy actors has been pretty critical in the UK for, you know, for th things almost happen in spite of in spite of national government in the UK. I think if you look at Germany or even the US, you see different things because you've got more decentral decentralized federalized systems. And then it depends upon the institutions at play between the national and the local level. So Germany, for example, does have this amazing development bank, state development bank, which I know a lot of, I mean, you probably found this in your work, Camilla, has funded a lot of projects locally um, for renewable energy in, in, a, in a way that just hasn't happened in the UK or in other, in other, in other polities. US is really interesting because um, some local uh, cities and, and towns have done really interesting things be because they do have local financial power and capacity. Um, interestingly, there's a new public bank being set up in California or a series of public banks. One, one of the things we want to go and explore. So in, def in, in decentralized federated systems in more advanced e economies uh, and even in even in places like parts of Scandinavia, where there is a lot more local autonomy at local level, you know, things are possible without without national governments. Um, necessarily, but obviously the na national level is still this, it's still this, it's still a seat of financial power um, because that's where the central banks or in, in the eurozone it's the it, 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 that doesn't apply so much. But but I think you know it, it without financial and institutional uh, capacities it, it, it's difficult to do much, and those are still held territorially at the national level. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Catherine, 
I was just gonna ask that question to you from Emily. <laughs> um, justice and equity are key elements in your study. Did you define parameters to uh, measure justice and equity? Uh, and of course, where is your research published? How can we refer to it? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just trying to find the link there to, to get my uh, thesis. Um, so I'll pop that in the chat. Um, but yes, I mean, justice and equity were a really important part for me to look at in my uh, PhD and I really wanted to make sure that that was a, a strong element to it. I found that a lot of the frameworks out there were quite uh, difficult um, to apply in practice. So, um, I mean, there's some really fascinating um, frameworks, one by my colleague um, Kristen Jenkins, um, and she looks at uh, energy justice through looking at sort of more social um, theory lens, you know, looking at procedural justice and distributional and, and recognition. However, I didn't actually use any of that myself. I did draw upon that um, when I was looking at my findings, but when I was speaking with policy practitioners, you know, it, it would have been pretty impossible to ask them whether they were familiar with these things. I don't think they would have understood a thing with what I was talking about. So I tended to avoid using the framework directly, but I did use it and refer to it um, later on in my thesis. Um, so yes, I will uh, provide a link to that. So thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a slightly longer question from Ellie Butterworth. I'm just gonna try read it out and summarize at the same time. Um, so Ellie says, I've also been looking at part dependency at Nottingham um, from the context of clean air zones, and she asked you to connect. Uh, the workplace parking levy is dependent on office-based revenue. The pandemic and the shift to hybrid working could have an impact on this revenue stream and a, a kind of exogenous shock that could redirect paths. I would be interested to hear if you have incorporated the potential for path redirection in your work. I think that's a really good point, Elle, and I'd be happy to connect, so please do um, drop me an email um, and we can arrange a chat. Um, so I think that's a really important point. You know, when I was doing my research, thankfully, it, it, I wasn't um, affected by it uh, because I'd done all my field work. Um, but I guess, yes, with the, the onset of the pandemic, there have been huge changes to the way people um, travel, especially with a lot of people working from home, and that could present uh, a problem um, for for the, the for income streams like which are dependent on those sorts of things. However, I think um, I, I haven't exactly looked at that. So the answer um, I, I haven't looked at path redirection, but I think it could be a very interesting thing for us to to look at. Um, so I'd certainly uh, like to get in touch and, and hear more about what, what Elle is thinking. Thank you, Catherine. Um, here's one more question from Jasper van Dijk, uh, which I think works very well for both of you. Um, how do you reflect on the interaction between public actors at different governance levels, for example, conflicting interests due to different incentives and their influence on municipal action for sustainability. I think that very neatly brings us back to this kind of connection to sustainability transitions in municipalities again. So either one of you want to start. <laughs> I can have a go if you like, Catherine. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in a way that's a $64 million question to tackling climate change, isn't it? Um, so not an easy question to answer and that's, and I'm not trying to, uh, I'll try to give you some kind of answer. But again, I think, I think that really depends upon this, the, the state you happen to be in and, and uh, the relation, you know, the, the level of the relation. I, I, I do think decentralized states, federate, you know, federated states where you've got more capacity locally, they seem to be the, or, or places where local government actors seem to have more power um, constitutionally or in, or it's their responsibility at a local level to, to still have capacity over local local public uh, services and infrastructures it seems to me where that happens you do get better better solutions um, it, it's interesting that it actually in some of the Scandinavian countries you, you, where you do have strong local local capacity but you also have national elites who are broadly committed perhaps to, to climate change in a way that doesn't happen elsewhere Having said that, of course, you you know I think there there, there clearly is, is a, a kind of vested interest um, lobbying um, set of relations going on at national level in all countries because that that is still those are where the key levers of power. 
And I think, you know, I mean, we see this in the UK especially, but I think it probably happens everywhere where, where, where big oil, you know, big oil companies or big energy companies in particular are able to influence national level politicians in, in, in ways that, in ways that I, that I, that I think do, do slow down attempts to, to, to deal with the transition and then, and then cascade down to local levels. So I think that, that kind of grip of, of national state actors they're kind of they're still gripped, I think, by corporate interests, in, and I think local, local level actors can be as well, especially if there's a, there's a powerful local employer, but not quite in the same way, I don't think. And that for, for me, that set of interests at the national level, um, I mean, you see it, you'll see it at COP um, in the next few weeks here in Glasgow. You know, you, it, it'll it'll ultimately be whether 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 strong political leaders of the key countries, you know, feel feel emboldened enough or, or whether they want to uh, depart from their their national domestic. Uh, economic actors and uh, enough enough to make make real trans real real progress if you like but i do think there's a lot that can happen locally and I, and, I, and i think even in the uk you know if there's if there's creative space for local actors it, it it does give us hope in a way but i think you have to understand there are these key blockages i think at national level and again i mean we've got our report up from the the empower project goes into that in quite a lot of a lot of depth i think but um but that is a key that is a key tension a key problem to to overcome but we we need to try and overcome it you know yeah i think i'll just add on to, to andy's um comment there i think that's a really good point and um as i was talking about agency in my presentation um i just wanted to highlight how individuals have such a key part in the transition at the local level and you know there were these council members um and even skilled officers who were really brave and did make those, um, those really bold decisions. And I think that was quite unusual in the Nottingham case study, but I think also that was in part um, influenced by the political stability that the, the council hadn't changed um, uh, administration in such a long time so that they could plan all these um, longer term environmentally and just initiatives. So I think it's a combination of that individual agency that we can see, but also that collective agency. But again, if you don't have this, um, the different levels of government um, meeting um, with the same sort of direction, if you don't have a strong direction from the national government, then it's extremely difficult for, for local to follow to, in those footsteps. Can I add one other quick thing here, which just come to my mind, but which comes out of our empower work actually, which is what I would call trans translocal uh, environmental virtue signaling. That's just off the top of my head. And what the, I think what what that, that is 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 if if, if you get uh, a local actor trying to convince powerful people uh, within their own local government and also at national level, if they can point to something that's happening across Europe that's been successful um, in in terms of carbon transition terms, energy transition. That often has quite an important political effect locally again. And we, and again, that's something that's something positive we've we found from our empower. Uh, project across across Europe. It's a hugely interesting uh, point. So what was that transnational, transgovernmental virtue signaling? I try to remember that. <laughs> Translocal trans local envir trans environmental virtue signaling. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about that as an idea. It's another mouthful. It's almost <laughs> as bad yeah. as globalization. Um, but anyway, it's a very, very interesting and valid point. Uh, Thank you both for such an interesting session. I really, really, really enjoyed myself uh, listening to you both. Um, it's just been really nice because I thought uh, both of your perspectives just really fit well together. Um, so yeah, I think we're coming towards the end of this webinar. Um, I would like to, as I just said, thank you both for being here and giving those very inspiring talks. Uh, I'd like to thank very much both Lisa and Alex from the RSA who supported us today and who do so throughout uh, organizing these webinars. And of course, last, not, last but not least, I really have to thank the attendees for, for uh, come, being here and engaging and asking such, such great, uh, great questions as well. Um, there are more free CREST sessions scheduled. The next one is taking place on the 25th of November in the afternoon, and it's on the subject of participation and community in energy transitions. Um, there's more information and also the opportunity to register for free uh, online on the RSA website in the respective session. A respective section on the Crest sessions. The website also uh, includes more information on our say, memberships, membership bands to consider both career stage and geography. And with that, it remains for me to say thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>